Right on. So I'm uh, Porter McRoberts, MD. I'm an interventional pain doc here in South Florida and Broward County in Fort Lauderdale. And this is Kyle Ina. Hi. Kyle is a rep for the Nevro Spinal Cord Stimulator Company. And uh, so I invited him to come and chat with me and with you guys as a bit has changed since I did my last uh, Neuromodulation University um, video. And I thought it'd be worthwhile to, to talk about. I think there are a lot of questions from patients about you know what, how the companies are different, how the therapies are different. And so even though Kyle's a Nevro um, uh, employee, he's worked for uh, other companies and uh, he has promised to be completely impartial and totally on label, which to explain to you what that means. So the FDA uh, regulates what these guys can sell these, uh, the products for in spinal cord stimulators are expressly, you know, really for, for pain, for radiculopathy, for failed back surgery pain, those kinds of things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not useful for other indications. They are. And uh, we use them for many of those indications. A lot of studies are out, out there looking at those indications, things like peripheral neuropathy or um, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, other types of um, nerve trauma, etc. So those are other uh, indications, but they're not necessarily uh, FDA approved and what we are what we call on label. So we're going to be discussing what, what's on label, what's changed about neuromodulation, and not just how Nevro has changed, but uh, how neuromodulation has changed in the past couple of years, and what's uh, what's clinically and usefully relevant to the patient, because that's the whole point of this is to to bring information to you guys so you can make good choices and ask good questions. So. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you for having me. Um, first question, I um, I didn't ask you this before. We had a little pregame uh, warm up, but um, how many? You know, I, I've done probably well over a thousand implants and uh, of spinal cord stimulators, which you know, not a lot of people do this all the time. So that's actually it may seem like not that many, but it is in my book a lot. But that pales in comparison, I'm sure, to how many you've seen in your seven years? Seven years I've been doing this, yeah. So how, if you were to guess, how many implants and trials have you been to? That's a good question. Um, probably, I mean, I think it's probably actually pretty similar to you over the seven years. Probably close to a thousand, I, I think. Um, trials and implants individually probably doing you know a couple hundred a year yeah that's a lot and over the seven years yeah um at least and i haven't been to maybe every single one of those cases but me or my team has been yeah. but we've managed those patients um that amount of patients you know when uh when we train fellows or other doctors who are doing this i always tell them you know the first person you talk to is the rep because they have seen and done more than you will ever see or do and that is true and you know the benefit you know i've I have seen, I don't know, maybe two dozen people do implants, maybe maybe three dozen actually do implants. You've seen hundreds of yeah. people do implants. Yeah. And so um, you bring a lot of clinical experience to, to this uh, discussion. First thing, so if you're watching this video, you probably are, you turned it on because you wanted to know if you might be a candidate for neuromodulation or spinal cord stimulation. They're interchangeable. Who is, what is the perfect patient how would you describe, like, when, who's the right patient for this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, typically, what we find that with neuromodulation, the patients that we'll do the best with is, first and foremost, it has to be neuropathic pain. It has to be pain coming from, from the spinal cord, from the nerves. Um, it doesn't work great for different types of pain, whether that's um, mechanical pain, stenosis it doesn't work great for, arthritis it's not going to help for. But what we're on label and FDA approved to work with is, um, chronic nerve pain of the trunk and limbs. So patients with either back pain, and if that radiates down to the legs, those are patients who typically, if they go through the trial, they respond well and, and have a good successful with the implant as well. Um, some patients describe that pain as numbness or tingling or burning sensation in the legs um, or in the back as well. It doesn't have to be both back and leg. You could have just one leg pain or bilateral leg pain. You could have just axial back pain um, those patients have all gone on to respond well with, with neuromodulation. Uh, great point and great discussion of labeling. 
uh, one of the things that is hard to define is neuropathic pain. Yeah. And uh, it, it, if we took two minutes and just described neuropathic pain, I think it's worthwhile. You described as burning or shooting or electrical. Yep. You know, nerve pain or neuropathic pain is really, I define it when I talk to patients, is pain that comes from a disease of the pain sensing system. So that disease could be diabetes, that disease could be a, a, a disc pressing on a nerve, it could have been a scalpel that cut a nerve during a surgery, it could be a, um, some uh, infectious process that, uh, that caused a nerve injury at some point, and now of course is over because you don't want to implant into someone who has an active infection. But when the, the nerves are affected, that's neuropathic pain. Yeah. And also what's kind of interesting is that you know, so, sometimes you'll, you'll see someone who had maybe a knee arthritis, bad knee surgery or something along the lines, and everything's healed up and they're doing fine, but they still have pain. What's interesting is, is in looking now, we have, we have the ability to look with recording electrodes, and we can place those electrodes in and along the spinal cord, the dorsal ganglion, even in the cortex. And we can see, even though that the, patholo the pathology, excuse me, doesn't exist or is gone, the patient is still actually feeling the pain. And that's when the pain sensing system is overreacting and maybe even almost inventing the pain. And we see this in, um, we call it the brain matrix uh, theory of pain. If you cut off a limb, you could feel the pain in the limb, even though the limb's not there. The brain is simply manufacturing the sensation of pain. So in circumstances where the nervous system or the brain are affected, and that's actually causing the pain, I find neuromodulation to be incredibly powerful. Yeah. But if it's, you know, you just stubbed your toe, if you have bad toe arthritis, a bunion, whatever it is, not, not, not a case. at all. Yeah. And sometimes even people have mixed pain. What is mixed yes. pain? Yeah, I mean, so one of the, in one of the first questions I, when I meet with a patient, whether it's on the phone or I meet a patient in the clinic or right before we're about to do a trial, one of the very first questions I ask is, you know, explain your pain. What is it, what type of feelings do you have from the pain? And is the pain constant? That's, I feel like is one of the, the bigger factors and when the pain is constant, you're, you're waking up at night because you have this pain, that's typically a, a sign that shows that yes, this is neuropathic. If it is pain that only comes on due to certain activities, when you're, when you're standing up and you're going to the grocery store and sitting down relieves the pain, a lot of times that could lean more towards something that's more mechanical, um, something coming from the actual spine that would not be a good candidate for a stim. Some patients have both, and sometimes you have mechanical issues, you have some stenosis, and you also have neuropathic pain going on underneath it. So the stimulators will not take away 100% of the pain, but that's really not what their intention is to anyways. Um, we're, no stimulator it's my is... my intention. <laughs> that's, our, that's all of our goal. And if we get 100% pain relief for, for a patient, that's we're all doing high fives, right? All, all the way. All the way. But, um, you know, we, we hope and we, we expect that this will take away at least half your pain, 50% of the pain. And, and some of that pain that's left over may still be pain that's not neuropathic what we call nociceptive pain yeah was the other yeah. the general type of pain um so the perfect patient is someone who really has neuropathic pain pain that's there all the time maybe influenced a little bit by what they do mm -hmm. you know walking seems to make it worse but it's there all the time that really is the perfect patient yeah. i I, yeah. I totally agree with you um now conversely Obviously, the person who has episodic or intermittent pain is less of a candidate. Is there are there other features of uh, of a patient that when you meet them, you say, you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned. This probably wouldn't be the best for you. Yeah, the first thing that kind of um, that kind of sets off an alarm in my head when when to think when I think of this, this may not be the best candidate for this therapy, is when they say that you know they only have back pain only when they stand. You know, they go to the grocery store, they lean over on the cart, and that relieves the pain. Okay. And, you Typical know, spinal stenosis. Yeah. Neurogenic claudication. Yeah. Yes. The, to me, those are the patients who, um, who most of the time, won't benefit the most from this. Um, I totally agree with you. I, I'll tell you what I think also. Um, and, you know, patients who are in pain, I forgive them everything because... I can't imagine what it's like to live in pain all the time. I've been in pain myself before, and thank God it was treated and several times. But um, so I forgive everybody their personality changes, their relationships with others, their 
frustration, anxiety, fear, all those things are what I think would be normal. Yeah. That said, the more when I meet a patient and if they have what I would characterize as unrealistic ex expectations or yeah. I absolutely positively have to be pain free, that is someone who's I'm pr I'm not going to be able to satisfy. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I might make them much better. Sometimes we do get 100% pain improvement. That's possible. But really, I'm looking for someone who's going to appreciate what pain relief is not going to just make them feel, but how it's going to change their life, what they would do with that pain relief, how they would be with their family. And then during the trial, people who are really focused on, you know, I was able to do X, Y, or Z, yeah. and I couldn't do that beforehand, or I was able to stand, I was able to have a conversation without getting frustrated. I saw these are all signs that I've got the right patient, or conversely. I may have someone who's, and I wouldn't say the wrong patient, someone I'm probably not going to be able to help as much. Yeah, yeah, I think um, having a good um, a good mind frame coming into the trial, having hope about this, um, although I know it's difficult if, if you're a patient who's, who's to this point where we're considering a spinal cord stimulator trial, you've been through a lot. And, they, and the hope is part of the package. It's part of it, and um, you may feel like, gosh, there's nothing out there for me, and now we're just trying one last thing on the hope and a prayer. Um, you know, it's not just the last thing, it's just the next step in the continuum of care. Um, but if you come into it with an open mind and come into it that there's a, there's a possibility and a strong possibility that this could work for you, and you know, you wouldn't be going forward for a trial if your physician didn't think you were a good candidate. Um, so if you're to that point where you're getting, you're, you're, this is brought up to you in the clinic and this is something that your physician is recommending for you, you're probably a good candidate for it. Um, so if you come into that trial with, with an open mind and with the expectations and the, and the hope that this is going to work, those patients also do better as well that I notice. Um, the patients who sometimes come in and they say, well, nothing works for me, why will this work? There's, there's um, not, as, not as good of outcomes with it as I've seen. I'd agree with that. And I would also second that patients who are putting all their, I mean, who say, I'm so hopeful, hopeful, hopeful. It's really hard, and everyone has hope. And sometimes I think the hope can even, maybe even sway the outcomes. I want people to, it's very challenging to be as objective as possible because, yeah. you know, you walk in, you think, this is it. You know, this is the last thing out there. It's not usually. There are plenty of other things. But it's, it's, it's positioned as being one of the late things that we try. It's certainly not like a shot. So that said, being objective about it, saying, you know what, does this really work for me? It's extremely important because once it's implanted, it's implanted. And it's, you know, I've taken stimulators out of people it didn't work for them. And I often think to myself, was this the right push patient to put it in the first place? The patient told me that they had great relief. Maybe I didn't, you know, I sensed there was something that they were just telling me that because they were hopeful. But I really want, you know, truthfulness. And yeah. I don't think people are out to deceive me at all, but truthfulness with themselves and really be harsh critics of the circumstance because I think if you are and you go in eyes wide open then you come out at least knowing exactly what it's going to do for you and there's nothing yeah. there's nothing hidden yeah definitely yeah um so let's talk a little bit about um the technology um back in the day actually the first uh implant that ever went in it was actually a um a patient with cancer kind of interesting and uh they, they resected the bone, and the patient had abdominal cancer, as I recall, and they resected the dura, they took away the bone, they took away the muscles, took away everything, they opened up the spinal canal, cut away the dura, put a couple electrodes right on the spinal um, uh, uh, cord and stimulated, and the patient had near complete relief, and then the patient died two years later, or two days later because of the cancer, actually. But it was the first time ever that we demonstrated that, that electricity controlled the nerves in the spinal cord. And we all know that nerves uh, work with electricity, but I think what we're starting to find out is that there's a certain software and there's a certain pattern and complexity to the way the nerves carry this pain message. And that's really Nebro's uh, first entree into the space was that they, they, they started long before they became clinically available, about 10 years prior with the concept that high frequency, and they had picked 10,000 hertz, that means 10,000 on-offs per second, would have clinical utility, and they tested, and they tested, and they tested, and then they did a prospective trial, and then they came out first in Europe and then here in the U.S. And so uh, that trial was 
it was the first time we used to aim for 50% pain relief in 50% of patients. And when I, long before you guys were on the market, that's what we were hopeful yeah. for. Yeah. And we, we did get that. And about 50% of the time, we had people cut their pain in half. And that was, that was a home run, you yeah. know. Uh, but your trial came out, and you guys saw much, much better results and something around 80% relief yeah. for 80% of patients, yeah. which I remember the first time I saw the data. And I was overwhelmed, quite honestly, because it meant an enormous amount for our patients. But I guess my question is, and you may not even know the answer, but why? Why do you think it is that high frequency has much more clinical impact, it seems, than, than just tonic stimulation? Excellent question. And, and truthfully, I think we're still learning. We're still learning about how these different um, waveforms work and how they interact with the neurons within yes. the spinal cord. But we're still learning that about tonic. We don't know the absolute reason how and why tonic works. We, we, we believe it's all based on theory that it's working yes. off of the gate control theory. Um, and what we, through clinical research that, that Nepro has done, and it started off with, with animal studies. Yes. Um, we started off with rat studies. We kind of progressed up the chain of, of animals, and they started um, studying goats. They implanted a goat with it. And then we started implanting humans with it. And, yes. and we've done a feasibility study, and then we led to the randomized controlled trial that we did. But we believe through the clinical research that we've done, where traditional tonic stimulation, and I, we may interchange the words tonic with traditional stimulation or low frequency. They're all kind of the same. They're all the same meaning, and which is how all spinal cord stimulation was done until recently, um, which is where, based on the gate control theory in an action potential was happening within the spinal cord and closing off that, that gate of pain that was um, sending messages through the spine to the brain. And what was left with was a paresthesia or a tingling sensation that the patient felt. Um, and what we were trying to capture with that is that anywhere a patient had pain, whether it was the back and maybe let's just say going down the left leg, we would try to overlap that with this new tingling sensation to help control or lessen the pain. Well, what we think is happening with dorsal, I'm sorry, with uh, nevro and high frequency stimulation is that we're not actually stimulating within the dorsal column. We believe we're actually stimulating the dorsal horn. Um, we stimulate in a different target area than we would if we were to turn on tonic stimulation. Us as reps, as when we program, we'll target a different neural target with high frequency than we would for low frequency, even if the patient's pain was the exact same. So if you had a patient with back pain or leg pain, us as, as the clinicians and the reps as when we program these devices, we would t stimulate in two different areas. One, the high frequency, we're going to target somewhere else. And if we were to turn on low frequency in that area, probably wouldn't be a good outcome. And vice versa, if we were to program a patient with low frequency to capture the area and then turn on high frequency there, that probably wouldn't be a good outcome as well. So you have to make sure we're, we're covering the right spots. Um, but going back to the question of, of how is it different and, and maybe why we're getting... Um, while we're getting better outcomes is going back to dorsal column stimulation versus dorsal horn stimulation. And there's different neurons that are in the dorsal horn that we're activating and that we're stimulating. And we're able to, to suppress painful neurons within the dorsal horn. And we're able to do it in a way without, without stimulating the excitatory neurons, the painful neurons, the ones of the um, sensory neurons. So we can quiet down the painful nerves without increasing any of the painful nerves. If that is a I think that's good. There's a, we use a lot of terminology. I kind of uh, like to think of this as like, imagine a cable carrying telephone calls between uh, say Europe and America. It's a big thick cable and that would be your spinal cord. It's got a lot of calls going through. It's you know carrying an enormous amount of data. That's the spinal cord. The dorsal horn is where the call comes in from say London and joins the cable. And so that comes in, and at the intersection with that and the big, the big main cable, there are a bunch of little nerves that control the, the quality of the call, whether the call actually goes through at all. These are wide dynamic range neurons, glial cells, etc. And so there's, there's a way to not just control the call, all the calls from Europe, but you can selectively, the problematic ones that are overactive, say, if if London had a bunch of prank callers calling the U.S., which probably has happened. <laughs> uh, 
but it selectively activates, and that's what you're able to see is that these wide dynamic range neurons, yeah. these neurons that control the call coming into the main cable are affected by, by high frequencies. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Am I yes. thinking yeah. of it correctly? Absolutely, yeah. It's a good analogy. I like that analogy. But it's different. And, you know, what I, I like is that it's another yet another pathway to control pain. It's kind of like, you know, if there's filters on experience, if you, you know, now you can't see me, now you can't hear me. If there's, I'm, tra I'm transmitting information to you guys visually, through auditory, through, if once you start shutting down the different pathways of pain, it seems more complete to me. And, you know, we used to do this with peripheral nerve stimulation. We put uh, one on the peripheral nerve. We put one in the gutter along the entering peripheral nerve right as it goes into the cord. Then we put one in the spinal cord. You know, if I could have put one, I'd put one in the brain. More is better in a way. And, you know, one of the... Um, one of my concerns had been with Nevro is that you guys had limited your, your therapy to simply uh, uh, 10,000 high frequency hertz. And so that I think while it works for a lot of people, I didn't, did not think it worked for everybody. And I saw clinical results from other approaches. And, um, but things have changed for Nevro in the, in the past couple of years. And so you guys now do a variety of different things. And so what, in addition to high frequency, is Nevro able to do? Yeah, so, um we have, we have changed, um, we've listened to physicians, we listened to the feedback of patients, and not every patient is gonna respond to every waveform or every therapy that's out there. There's um, patients who might respond well to this in the one waveform, and then don't respond to another, or a patient that may respond to these two over here, and these two over here didn't work for them. So every patient's different, and um, we listen to that feedback from physicians, and we listen to that feedback from patients as well, that there's other waveforms that we can offer patients and we're now doing that where we've opened it up to now where we can program these stimulators and these devices to not only offer high frequency stimulation but we can do traditional tonic low frequency stimulation um, we can do combination therapy we can run the two of them together at the same time virtually so that you get a combination program yeah um, there's other frequency ranges besides 10,000 hertz. Um, I think important to note though um, about high frequency and, and it's called HF10 is that the 10 comes from the 10,000 kilohertz. When we were studying 10,000, we didn't just pick and randomly choose 10,000. There, there's a reason we got to 10,000 hertz. Uh, we looked at you know lower frequency ranges, basically everything from zero and, and probably past 10,000. Mm -hmm. um, but what we saw is that once you get above 5,000 hertz, that's when you actually start to change and activate the wide dynamic range neurons within the dorsal horn. And then we saw the biggest change in that when we got to 10,000 hertz. And that's kind of how we, we went to 10,000 hertz. But there's a, still a lot of clinical research to be done, I believe, on other frequencies, maybe higher frequencies, maybe lower frequencies, those mid-range frequencies. There's, there could be more evidence to see if any of these therapies work. But um, with the guidance of the physician, and the patient, if we want to try a lower frequency program, something that's below 10,000 hertz, we can now offer that to patients. So if you go forward with a spinal cord stimulator trial, and even if you get great results with one therapy, there's still other, other frequencies that with this one device with Nevro that you could still try out during the trial and during the implant as well. Um, I think that, I think you said that uh, politically correctly. <laughs> um, so some of the other things that are happening is, um, you know, uh, Abbott has come up with something called Burst. And uh, Dirk DeRitter, who's a friend of mine, um, came up with a concept that um, a, a different type of, we'll call it a waveform. It's not necessarily a difference in frequency, but it's the way the, the electricity is sculpted. It's kind of almost the difference between AM and FM. But um, th what he was able to demonstrate is not only did it work for pain, but there's some other things that occurred actually cortically uh, in the brain. And his initial research had been actually with cochlear implants and with uh, tinnitus and deep brain stimulation. He thought about the brain in a completely different way. The guy's a total genius. But he thought about how um, the brain listens to signals and then also becomes um, used to listening to signals. And he, he tried to approximate the brain's language. And so what I've seen, actually, and I think probably the next things that we will see, not only in, um, in Nevro, but other spinal cord stimulators, is 
sculpting those frequencies, sculpting the way the message is sent, changing the software so that the, the spinal cord really can't ignore. Uh, a lot of times there's habituation with tonic spinal cord stimulation. That was one of the major issues that people liked it and then after time they kind of, they got used to it. And so, you know, I'm very hopeful that some of the, the research that's ongoing presently um, will we'll show that we can speak the language of the cord, not just send it electricity, but really talk to it in the way it wants to be whispered to. So that bursting is just the beginning of that, and I think you guys have a similar type of uh, uh, program, actually. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, we do. We have a, um, a burst-like program that we can that we can add to your settings, um, whether that's for the trial, whether that's during the implants. We can combine that with other types of, of fr uh, frequency programs as well. So. One of the greatest things about this is that it's we just tailor it to the patient and we there's not just a one size fits all for the patient we can try different things we could try a low frequency program we could try a high frequency program we could take them both at the same time we could try a burst light program we could try a high frequency program we could put the two of those together um, and try a burst 10k program so you're getting a little bit of, of both options and you may find that you respond better to one than the other so sounds like uh Instead of just playing one instrument by itself, it's more like a symphony. Is that true? That's a good analogy, yeah. Yes. Um, people, do you, I mean, you've uh, seen a lot of these, do people, do you think, do better when it's com in combination? I think we're still learning. Um, we have some some clinical research that, um, out from Australia, that we've been tracking these patients, and we're in, in-house, we are tracking these patients as well. For any time we program a patient um, that is using a frequency outside of high frequency, we're following these patients and following up with them and calling them and to see how well they're doing with these programs. Um, I personally have some success with it as well. Um, I've had success with pairing low frequency with high frequency, putting them together, and I've had success with Burst 10K. Um, and, and then we, we had a ton of success with high frequency. Um, high frequency is what we have the most, for us, it's what we have the most clinical research on. So us as a company and us as, as, clini as the clinicians and the reps who are programming the device, we like to lead with that. We like to start with that. We have the most evidence. We have the most confidence that that's going to work, hopefully, the best for that patient. But we have other programs kind of in our back pocket that we can that we can use. So one of the things, you know, I was told you I was impressed with the study, and I think anyone who does neuromodulation was incredibly impressed with the study. Um, I'll tell you one of the things. I always, a study is a study. We're picking the, the best patients. We're picking the ones that we know we can help. And so it's kind of like, you know, swinging only at pitches that go right over the plate. I would say that that's my critique of, you know, of randomized controlled trials is that, you know, if, if you're showing efficacy, you're really picking uh, the best. That said, you guys have a, a, a real world uh, follow up study. And how many patients are in that study? I believe 1,660 patients were in this study. That's a lot of patients. And what has, so these are people who are implanted. Yes. We were then followed up, and they, how long have they been followed? Um, some of them were, so these were coming from different sites. It was a multi-site. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them were tracked out for two years. Some were even longer than that. There were some of these patients with some have been tracked. They've been implanted for four years. Um, I think what the data was collected on, though, was I, I want to say it was out to two years. Okay. Well, that's a good long time. Um, and what did that, did that data from the real world study did it show anything similar or parallel to the randomized control? So trial? I think that's the most impressive part of it is that it showed the almost identical outcomes from what we were what we saw in the randomized controlled trial, the RCT that got us the FDA approval, almost the exact outcomes as this real world study the, um, that we looked at with 1,600 patients. The outcomes, the response rates, the percentage of pain relief, the vascular changes were almost identical. They were in the high 70s for both back and leg, for both patients, uh, for both arms. Um, and that's been the most impressive thing I think about as far as when I look at the clinical research. The outcomes were the same whether it was the randomized controlled trial, whether it was the retrospective study, or whether it was the, the study that got published for in Europe. All the outcomes were basically the same. So we have different sets of patients, different sets of yes. government bodies that are overseeing these studies, different types of physicians that are doing this. Europeans are sites. very different than Americans. They, they treat different. The patients are different, I'm sure. But it doesn't matter where you are, what hands you put this in or, or what the patient is, with their, as long as they're a candidate for the study, yeah. whether they're a neuropathic um, patient, 
the, the outcomes have been the same across all the studies. It's really impressive. You know, real world studies are, those are the kind of studies that, uh, you know, if you didn't have your head turned initially, you've got to say, wow, that's pretty impressive. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, anything else with the software, with the, you know, with the therapy that you think is interesting or worthwhile talking about before we move on? Um, well, with the device, um, not only is it able to program multiple therapies today, but there's going to be future programs that haven't been developed yet that are still being studied. Um, the new battery that we just launched, the Omnia battery, not only can it do all these different programs for you, but it's also upgradable. So the software is upgradable, meaning if any new therapy comes out in the future, a new type of waveform, we learn more evidence on a better way to do this. We can do a better mousetrap, so to say. Um, you don't necessarily need, the patient doesn't need to go through another surgery to get the newest battery. Most likely we can just, if it's a software something, if it's a software issue, we can just upgrade their battery, their software without going through a surgery. So you're not only getting access to all the waveforms you have today, but anything in the future that's gonna come out, you'll have access to that as well. Tremendous. Okay, thank you very much. Shifting to just, you know, any just general neuromodulation that we're talking about, it doesn't matter what company, et cetera. Um, what are some trial do's that you'd like, I mean, if you could counsel a patient, you had time to sit down and tell them, listen, you just had the stimulator leads put in, and I wanna make sure you understand this, what would you say to them? Yeah, so um, there's some, some rules that we want the patients to follow, um, and it's really just for the best interest of, of yourself going through this. We want this to work for you. We're all on the same team here. Um, so first and foremost, I would say, it's just the open communication with, with what, whoever your representative is they will be calling you throughout the course of the trial. It's not to bother you, it's really to find out how you're doing so they can give real-time feedback to the physician and on the fly we can make changes with these programs. All, all these devices can be reprogrammed, all these devices can, can be changed throughout the course of the trial so that if one's not working for you, let's try to change it and get something that's gonna be optimal for you. We can optimize this therapy for you. So um, the most important thing is just honest communication with your rep and with the physician that you're working with. Um, if it's working for you, great, let us know that. If it's not, let us know that because um, the trial is not just a one-day trial. Um, it's gonna be extended uh, you know, three to seven days or possibly even longer. And there's a time in there for, for this to work for you. And it may not be the first program that you get and you may try a couple different programs, that's okay, don't lose hope. There's, there's other programmings that the rep can give you that can still give you the pain relief that you're needing. Um, some other things that the do's and don'ts that we don't want patients to do, uh, we all call it the BLT, so the bending, lifting, twisting. So no bending at the waist. If you have to bend, the old saying, if you have to pick something up off the floor, bend at the knees, don't bend at the back. Um, the reason for that is we put these wires, these leads in a very strategic spot. The physicians put them in a very um, specific spot. And millimeter movements can change things. And the leads are gonna move a little bit. They're not sutured internally. This is just a temporary evaluation. The leads are gonna come out we expect a little bit of movement, but we want to avoid major movement migration of these leads. If the leads were to move, it's not going to hurt you as a patient. You probably wouldn't even know they moved other than the fact that, hey, one day you were feeling good, and then the next day you're kind of feeling crappy again. Your pain's starting to come back. One of those, one of the um, explanations could be that the leads moved a bit. So we just want to be careful with the, the movement that you're not going out and, and doing yoga that week. You're not doing physical therapy. You're not going to the gym or... or golfing or fishing, anything with a lot of excessive turning and twisting, we want to really limit that so that through the course of this trial, these leads can stay in place as best as they can. Um, that's a, that's a big, um, important step to follow. Um, no showering the week of the trial, okay? Water naturally has bacteria in it, um, so we don't want to get any bacteria anywhere near the bandages. Um, it's one of the bigger risks of this, of this whole process is infection. It's extremely rare. Um, I've been doing this for seven years, and I think I've maybe seen one or two trials that ever got an infection. It's extremely, extremely rare, but it's because we take steps like this of asking the patients not to shower. You can sponge bath, you can wash your hair in the sink. We just don't want to get water, get water on you. Um, no swimming. Maybe, no swimming, especially down here in Florida, right? Yeah. Um, the tape, you'll have a lot of tape on your back, and especially down here in the heat and the sweat, sometimes that tape starts to come off. Don't take the tape off, okay? Leave the tape on. If you need to apply tape on top of it, you can do that. I always advise my patients, 
you can, it's okay to add tape, but don't take or don't replace the tape that's already on. If your dressing in the back starts to come off, let the rep know. He can notify the physician. Come in. And they'll bring him in, bring you into the office, and absolutely and we can look at it. And, and the, this is all for your safety. It's to make sure that there's no infection going on. Any fevers, any chills, any other signs of infection, yeah. sweats, night sweats. If it does get wet for some reason, I want it to come in and have you have a change to dry bandage. If you notice any drainage coming out, any. Uh, um, clear liquid that might be cerebral spinal fluid, for example, any blood that won't stop bleeding, any pus for sure, of course. Um, you know, the, the eyes and ears of the patient are the best um, sensing equipment we have, period. So yeah. you know, I, I trust our patients, but they need to know. You know, if there's anything that's, uh, that looks funny, we need to know immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other, what are some do's of yeah. the trial? Yeah, so we want to set some goals at the beginning of the trial, I think it's important. We want to start with a baseline of what you could do functionality-wise before the trial, what can you do during the trial. Um, so we'll probably ask you, you know, what's your pain score today? Like before we even do the procedure, we'll ask you, what's your pain score? Zero out of 10, how bad does the pain get? You may notate that as an eight or whatever your pain score is. So then throughout the course of the week, we want to see, does your pain scores drop? Does it go from an eight to a four? Does it drop to a two? Um, that's not the only way we assess pain. There's, there's multiple ways we can assess on how well this is working. Um, your functionality. So if before you couldn't even walk to your mailbox because the pain was bad and you couldn't, you can't, you know, spend time with your grandkids or you can't even go out to eat and enjoy a normal, normalcy life. Let's see if you can do some of those things. Now we don't want to push it. And if you can't even walk down the block, I don't want you to go run a marathon the next day, but Let's see if you can walk a block. Let's see if you can walk three blocks. That's great imp improvement. You know, I have some patients who say they can't sit through a dinner. They have to get up. They're always constantly moving and fidgeting around. All right, let's see how long can you sit. If you couldn't only sit 10 minutes before and now you're sitting 30 minutes, that's huge. That's great improvement. Those are all positive steps. Um, the reason that we're doing this is it's not just about numbers and percentages of pain scores, but it's about getting your life back and um being able to do the normal activities that everybody kind of takes for granted. And, and you don't really realize those things probably until you're, you're living through, through chronic pain. I think those are excellent. I'm trying to think if I have any other do's or don'ts. I've got about a billion, but you know, they're, they're going to be specific to you as a patient. Um, but those are very good, you know, general, uh, do's and don'ts. Um, so there are a variety of steam companies. I, I use them all and I like them all. And I think they're all, do a very good job, um, an excellent job actually, of, uh, of taking care of the patients, of providing you know, everything that they can um, as uh, legally allowed by law to, to help patients. Um, that said, um, there's, there's some doctors that put in, so there's, there's an option when you have the, the, the placement of the leads. The leads are generally cylindrical. They're about the size of a spaghetti. Um, and maybe a little more stiff than a wet spaghetti. And they have a little wire that would help some, us guide them up the uh, inside the spine. But there's, there's, there's two ways to put these in. You can even put them in, you trial them with the percutaneous leads, the little noodles. But then with a, uh, the permanent implant, we have a choice, whether to put in the noodles again uh, versus a paddle. And there's some pros and cons to both. And I thought that was worth not that this is necessarily something that you guys as, as patients will be deciding, but I, I think it's important that you understand why we make the choices we do in recommending uh, one over the other, uh, for example. So the paddle is a, a insulated, um, it looks like a paddle, um, maybe a spatula, and we slide it in the canal. Now in order to do that, uh, we have to take a bit of bone off. So we have to do either a laminectomy or a laminotomy and that takes a larger incision. We have to remove the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments. So the surgery is larger uh, to put in a paddle lead. Um, and there's, the recuperation is a little more intense. And quite honestly, if it must be removed or moved, it requires another surgery. So in a surgery where we cut down to the bone and you would need a, a neurosurgeon or a spine surgeon, not necessarily a spinal interventionalist to do that. That sounds like a lot of negatives to me. I mean. And I always say the, the beauty of neuromodulation is that it's reversible. It is not necessarily reversible without cutting uh, with a paddle. Now, that said, for me, the paddle also does have some utility. So what are, what, when would you 
when do you hear that a paddle is suggested? Yeah, so um, sometimes it's, it's anatomically driven. So if during the course of the trial, um, spinal cords are not all the same and you have some cords that are twisted and I've, I've been in trials where you steer the lead, the lead and it should be going perfectly posterior midline and it just keeps falling off, it keeps going one direction or the other and maybe we can get one lead placed, it's not optimally placed but we can get one that's kind of good enough and that's better than sending the patient home with no trial um, and if the patient goes to the trial and has success with that your physician may decide hey you, you know that was not optimal placement and we could send you out for a paddle lead and that would be a little bit easier in that situation to place the lead without having to drive it up from from the lumbar region and um, a surgeon could put in the paddle lead um, that might be one reason to go for a paddle lead um, Research shows that there are a lower percentage of migration. Um, percutaneous leads can move. I think we have um, good suturing techniques nowadays and good anchors that keep these into place. And, and after about six weeks or so, scar tissue will start to form around these leads and hold them into place to help us with migration. But the paddle leads will, when they scar in as well, just naturally the way they're designed, kind of they're shaped, we call them a paddle because they're like the, an oar paddle. They're shaped yes. like, the, like the paddle of an oar. And the way that they're designed when scar tissue forms up around it, it locks them into place a little bit better. Um, so that's a benefit as well. If you're somebody who's super active, um, you know, maybe you're, you're a golfer, you're an avid golfer, and you're doing a lot of moving and twisting, you know, the percutaneous lead shouldn't move, but um, the paddle leads may stay in there a little bit better and not, not move as much. Um, also the energy consumption as well. So um, I think this was probably more relevant back in the days of tonic stimulation, where when we would program this to get paresthesia in the areas of the patient of pain, some patients it was, it was really light and right when we turned it on they could feel it and it was a low energy consumption. Some patients required us to turn it up really strong. Well, when we move forward to the implant, that will affect the longevity of the battery. If we have to put more energy into it, the battery won't last as long. If we use um, percutaneous leads, those are the, the way the energy is dispersed is circumferential so that it's going out 360 degree, um, degrees so not all the energy is directly applied to the to the core to the nerves with the paddle lead everything's on the bottom of the lead and it's all unidirectional going towards the cord so we can use a little bit less energy with the paddle lead as opposed to a percutaneous lead um, but nowadays with these newer waveforms out there that are not paresthesia based we don't really run into that as much that's interesting. Paresthesia is, of course, the, the feeling of the TENS unit that, uh, that we, uh, with the, we don't have with the new waveforms. They're all sub-threshold, so you really can't, can't feel them. No, I completely agree. You know, I, uh, I've sent, I'd probably say, under 5% of my, my perms do we, we use a paddle. Um, and just for those reasons, you know, I think it's, uh, it's a little more invasive, nevertheless, but if it's if you had pattern, let's say you had percutaneous leads and they do move around, or you know that it's in the sweet spot, et cetera, and you do a revision, paddle may be the, the yeah. precise way to yeah. go. Or if you are using a lot of power. Yeah. All right. Um, moving on to another subject, anything else that we need to talk about with uh, leads or? Um, I think the only other thing we didn't maybe mention is the MRI compatibility. Okay, yeah, very the, good. Um, MRI conditional, I, I guess is a better way to say it. Um, back in the day, none of the devices were conditionally approved. And I have to say conditionally approved because none of the devices are actually technically MRI compatible. Um, they all have some form, if they do, they have some form of MRI conditional labeling. Um, and what that means is that before, um, you couldn't get an MRI with these devices implanted. Um, the technology has improved across the board for all the companies and there are certain leads, whether that's a percutaneous lead or a paddle lead, and there's some, certain batteries, depending upon which, which company you have, that will be MRI conditionally approved and some that will not be MRI conditionally approved. So that's something that's um, important to you. Speak with your physician about that and make sure that, that um, you get the proper equipment there. In short, what it means is that if you, MRIs are pretty common imaging modality and um, I don't think there is a STEM device that isn't approved necessarily, that you cannot get an MRI. Now, that said, you may be able to get an MRI of your head only in some, you may be able to get an MRI of a leg or an extremity in others, 
There are some that are, are approved for the entire neuroaxis, the spine, and others may not be. There are some batteries that are not approved and some leads that are. But conditional simply means that you may be able to get an MRI. You likely will be able to get an MRI, but maybe it'd have to be instead of a 3 Tesla, a 1.5 Tesla, which is simply the strength or the fidelity of the MRI. So it's really important prior to this, you know, we could get CT scans, CT myelograms, x-rays, ultrasound, all these kinds of things. But it has been a big advance to actually be able to get MRIs now. And it's good to know that Nevro and luckily most other uh, products uh, on the market are, are MRI approved, at least conditionally. I think that's, that's very true. Um, so this is not a Nevro product, but you did work for another company that sold something called a dorsal root ganglion stimulator. Yeah. And that's something that I've used quite a bit and have a fondness for. Y you were able to, uh, to be a part of that or not? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Um, the, the dorsal ganglion is, when we talk about it, it's a little bit like, it, it's actually the control center to the collar uh, before it gets to the main cable. And it actually lives in the side of the spine right here. And the reason I bring it up is neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulation, isn't necessarily the perfect thing for everybody. There are other targets. And one of the other targets, not just the peripheral nerves, for example, but the dorsal root ganglion. So there is a, a methodology to, to place a lead intraspinally and epidurally go up and then selectively activate and stimulate the nerve that goes to a very discrete region of the body. And so we say dorsal ganglion stimulation. I think for me, this has the most clinical relevance in people who've had a, a very finite, uh, discrete area of pain, say their big toe, a knee problem, a hip or an injury possibly to this nerve, or they had, um, for me, post herpetic neuralgia, a certain dermatome, for example, example, and they just continue to have pain in that dermatome. There can either be some crosstalk between but if the pain's in a discrete area, I find that to also be a pretty useful uh, modality. Um, there's some challenges. You have to look at the spinal anatomy a little more uh, uh, carefully. You have to plan your approach a little more carefully. If you have someone who has spinal stenosis, you know, the, where you go in versus your, your target may be some distance, so you have to uh, calibrate and evaluate for that. But that's another modality I think is worth talking about and I have talked about in the past and probably when I have uh, uh, another rep on who works for that company will talk a little bit more about it. The other thing is that we do, and I think is actually is seeing a, uh, a renewed interest is peripheral nerve stimulation. I don't know if you ever saw peripheral nerve stimulation when you worked for uh, the other company. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I've done some of those. Um, that's something that we see, I see great utility for, and I think it's coming back. There's a renewed interest, and I think in just the same way, you know, it's like if you could, instead of treating the telephone line, you might treat the, the telephone. Um, we'd love to treat the caller. Uh, that's called, you know, doing something to actually treat the, the source of the pain. But treating the telephone is really the peripheral nerve stimulation. Sometimes that can be incredibly discreet if you have, uh, say, nerve pain in a foot or in a, uh, the distribution of the carpal tunnel nerve or the radial nerve. We can really get very, very focused. The other nice thing about peripheral nerve stimulation is it seems to work in mixed modalities. So, say people have a shoulder problem for a uh, a stroke or a bad shoulder surgery or something along this where we really want to stimulate both the motor nerve and the sensory nerve. We can do so with peripheral stimulation quite well. These are a lot of things we talked about and it's kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, but I thought we did, uh, we talked about a lot that's new. Is there anything else that's new that has happened in the past couple of years that you think is important for, for folks to know? Um. <clears throat> Good question. Um, I think we touched on a lot of it. I think the the biggest advancement in neuromodulation is just really the evidence and the, and the research. And there's been a lot more clinical research done across the board for all the companies. Never has invested a lot into researching um, how this works, the mechanism of action, how, what other types of patients can we help treat with this. Um, we have a lot of ongoing studies with this. Um, and it's all advanced to the field, and, and some of these other modalities, like you spoke about, dorsal or ganglion stimulation, these are all positive things. These are all things that are pushing the field forward and advancing the therapy for the patients to get better outcomes. I think it's safe to say that the outcomes that we're getting today with neuromodulation are better than what we got even five years ago. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And it's such a pleasure for me because, you know, I mean, I know you do when, when it's working, 
man, it's wonderful to go home and see my family and you, you feel, you can't help but feel, you know, the success of the patient for yeah. the patient. And when it's not working, let me tell you, it, it also it sucks. Yeah. It's, it, it's more than that. It's, you know, you know, I always say it's, I feel like I get paid to be Santa Claus, but you know, it does, it's a real bummer when the presents aren't working or when it's not working. So it is such a nice feeling to know yeah. that, and I've seen a huge uh, increase in the, the number of patients who do well, not just with the trial, but who also go to perm, and then who also get relief years down the road. I mean, we had a patient that came in a few days ago. I had implanted about four years ago for an off-label condition. And my uh, boy said, you know, the, the unit turned off. Now, this, of course, is paresthesia-free. You, can't, you don't know when it's on or off other than the pain relief. Going. So there's no, like, light that's on or off. You just... And it, his pain came back immediately, and he knew in his feet he couldn't even walk. He got out of the car. He couldn't even, he had to go back, and lo and behold, it had turned off, and he turned it back on, and now he could walk. And he just said, you know, 80, 90% plus pain relief for four years was pretty incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. And those folks are out there, yeah. and we do get to see them. They're often out on, you know, cruises and in the casinos and going and seeing their grandkids and skiing and doing all those fun things that we're not necessarily doing. But... I, I want to close by saying thank you very much for, for coming. And um, I don't think we talked about anything necessarily off label. Try to work hard around that. But um, thank you for having me. It was, it was an enjoyable conversation. I, my pleasure. So, with that, hasta la vista. And uh, if you have any questions, if you want to come see me, you please do not hesitate to make an appointment. I'm in Broward County, in South Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, be happy to see you. Thanks.